Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Geomologist Presents. It's been some time. Well, not really. I guess it's been about a week. Well, almost a week. Man, I have such a backlog of games that I've run and played, but I'm not going to talk about all of them. I might give a summary of what I'm playing, but that's cool. I might you know, the, hit the highlights of the things that I've run, which I think is the, I mean, you can see various of these games on a YouTube channel. I play a lot of games with Kevin Madison, Dungeon Musings. Um, but I'm going to kind of maybe summarize some of the games that I've run. And you probably could hear recaps of those um, throughout the different podcasts in the podcast verse from Jason Connerly to BJ Boyd um, to maybe Arlen Walker, who I'll play in my games. So what should I talk about first? I don't know. Let's let me think about that for a little bit. Let's get some call-ins in and I'll respond to those. I have call-ins from Jason Connerly and Joe Richter. And uh, yeah, let's listen to those first and uh, let me respond to them. Carl, Jason here. Sorry I couldn't make the Pathfinder game, but again, I want to congratulate you for sticking to your guns this year and not letting a night go to waste, but running a, a one-shot with the players you had available. I, I, I think that's admirable. I'm all for it. And you got to run in Hyperborea again, which I know is something you've been wanting to do. So very cool, very awesome. And I look forward to playing again soon. So whether it's Pathfinder 2 or... If I happen to show up when there's a light crew and play in Hyperborea, either way. By the way, one thing you might want to think about, something Trey Webster's been talking about, is having a set crew of characters, and just whoever shows up picks one of those characters and plays them. And for the pickup game, the game you do when not everybody's there, that might work really well. And, and those, you know, so you, people might get the same character each time, they might not, but it's the same set of characters, and that'd be easier for you, the GM, to manage. That is a great idea, actually. There's like um, some pre gens, like the Rose Gallery. There's like 12 of them or so, maybe 11. And characters could pick from that Rogue's Gallery and we can mix and match. I think um, in this last game, well, let's let me talk about the uh, pickup games or the pickup game. Instead of playing Pathfinder, or we usually play Abomination Bolts on that Wednesday. That was last Wednesday, January 19th. Uh, only two of the players were able to make it, so I ran some Hyperborea, and I decided to run a two-person Hyperborea of the adventure, The Late Trapper's Lament, which is the adventure that comes with the um, Kickstarter, the latest Kickstarter, Hyperborea 3rd Edition. And, um, yeah, it's a... I like it. It's a pretty cool adventure. The players kind of going back to Jason's point. Um, I have a rogues gallery. Um, there's a second rogues gallery that was published and there's a rogues gallery in the main second edition book. And the players both selected from rogues gallery too. And they picked a Chimerian male cataphract named Nicomedes, the lawgiver. He doesn't have a horse at first level. They're both at first level. And the other person played a male Saxon barbarian named Ator Burr. So good, good group, I think. I think it was a good group. And um, right, so they're coming to this island. They're coming to New Vinland uh, in a boat. The boat is called the Otherworld Obelisk. And... The captain kind of pulls him over and says, hey, we got a problem. Um, well, you know, usually we're getting these really cool ermine pelts 
and the local trap was due hours ago with a bundle, but he's not here. It's very uncharacteristic. So you guys as Marines on my boat, go find them. There will be, um, in addition to your 10 gold pieces that I'm paying you upon completion of, to the journey, we're heading towards Port Zangarios. I'll give you three gold pieces per pelt. So, um, yeah, so they he takes off. He goes to where he's going to hang out um, with his, uh, his I guess, uh, first mate. And the rest of the crew is hanging out at this other place. And the players could, player characters could camp out there if they wanted to for free. But I think the good thing, I think, is the characters, they get on it. It's about five o'clock. They feel like there's an hour and a half of light and they can get uh, to where they need to go, um, find out some things. So they uh, they talk to the a man who knows the trapper. The trapper's name is Ulfer. There are a lot of spoilers here, just by the way, because this is from, uh, you know, the tra- late trapper's lament. But uh, I like it. It's a good adventure. It's a good intro adventure for low-level players. So they find from the Warfinger about the, about the trapper. They find out where he lives. They kind of go to the, the tavern and find some rumors. They talk to several people in town. And I thought what was cool is they recruited someone. They recruited the they recruited the guy's mistress. And it turns out, I don't know. I think I, this is different from the adventure. I made Una a an acolyte, a cleric, a follower of the goddess of the moon. Um, there are also some rumors that they're werewolves, so the players might think she's a werewolf. I don't know. Anyway, um, I was cagey about it. They also grab a couple sailors. Uh, they do really, I use like, um, I kind of use the reaction role recruitment, and they did really well on both recruiting Una, talking to people, uh, talking to kind of in a way, Una is like a thrall who is a washerwoman. And the head, the woman who's in charge of the wa- of the washerwoman who makes them do the work uh, said they had to pay for her for a day, for example. So they did that, and uh, they, I think they made some good friends in town. Then they uh, they headed out uh, into the wilderness. Um, nothing really happened there. They got to the house. Uh, the man was dying. They got there kind of when the man was dying. I, I, what I really liked, just to step back a, sec- a second, is how the two players. Um, one of them is B.J. Boyd of the Arcane Alienist, and another one is a guy named Matt, who you might know as at Erks on the Discord. He has given me permission to tell everyone who he is. He plays in a lot of my games, so it's cool. He played the Comedies, so and B.J. played Ator Burr. So they got to the house. Um, the house was in tragedy. Uh, they heard the woman's wailing. They had gotten there on the Ulfur, the trapper, had just died. So his son, Uller, and his wife um, are inconsolable. Uh, But they do good on their talking and reaction, and they're able to find out what happened. Um, Apparently, he had set these traps. Um, One of the traps, instead of being dead, the creature was undead and bit bit him. Um, And he came back, and he became sick and feverish. he left the pelts over there. So the players, um, well, while they were talking, the man came to life as a zombie and they had to dispatch him. And I thought it was another, I think it's a providential for this game and maybe a campaign in the future is Nicomedes with his first attack at the zombie rolled a crit and ran it through the head. So uh, they found out, they found a map, they found out the location of all the traps. So they, Kind of went them from uh, one. They went kind of went clock war, clockwise, and unfortunately, the only thing that was interesting was in the last one they hit um, because they went clockwise, and they with them you know they're having um, so it's you know the two player characters the comedies and Ator Burr with Una, um, and then Uller the son with the torch because he knows where they are, um, although Ator Burr has is a barbarian and has good tracking skills. He cuts across and, you know, the terrain and they make really good time. So uh, they discover the zombie ermine, the giant zombie ermine. Oh, they also found, before they even left the house, they found a baby zombie ermine. Um, Ermine, ermine, I don't know how you pronounce it. 
a weasel-like creature that changes like a stoat, that its coat changes color in the winter. It's not winter. Anyway, um, they're, they, Ator Burr actually jumped into the well and had to fight this thing kind of solo. Uh, no big deal. He did really well. So, um, yeah, they're doing, they're doing really well, um, considering there's only two uh, PCs for a four PC module and they have like it's two PCs and, and, a um, a henchman and some hirelings. So I think it, it's working really well. Um, but that's kind of how cool these games, these OSR type games are, is that you can rely on henchmen and hirelings and they can bolster your forces and give you some, some push if you use them well. And I think they used them pretty well. Um, anyway, they dispatch both the uh, undead ermine in the well and the one in the trap. And he finds a lot of tracks. They find where um, there was a bundle might have lay there on the grass and the leaves, and someone uh, took it. And uh, they follow it to a cleft in the rocks, which leads to a cave. They figure there's probably like seven people down here. They see seven sets of tracks. Um, they see that in the entry cave, there is an ermine that has been killed along with its uh, progeny. Um, so I guess there's other pelts for them to collect. Uh, Uller is able to start working on that. And he also, they're also working on these um, pelts from the undead ones too. They're not too messed up. So they're getting their own pelts to add to the bundle that hopefully they will find and make some more money, which would be kind of cool. So yeah, so they get into here. They, the only thing, and we stop after a fight with a, uh, zo another zombie, and this one looks to be a, like a drowned zombie of a sailor. Um, so they're curious to see what it lies beyond. Uh, they were able to dispatch it. Um, it kind of surprised them, but um, yeah, some good tactics. And I think I think the declaration of actions really helped because it kind of focuses the players, and they kind of know what they're going to do when they're when the initiative pass comes around. It's group initiative. Um, so they can decide who wants to go first, although it is in order of operations, right? So they there used to be a two-phase system in Hyperborea Second, and they shifted it down to a one. It's it's a hybrid one system, so it's melee if you're engaged, uh, missile, magic, and then move. And that move also includes any move with a melee. So if you're going to charge or if you're going to move, um, and then engage someone without a charge, you go at the end of the round. Um, and I think it works really well. So we didn't have any issues. No one um, no one got upset about declaration of actions ahead of time, which is always a good thing. And uh, it worked really smoothly. I think um, when I've played in conventions with people who are designing the modules I played at North Texas RPG Con a couple times with some of the authors of these modules, and uh, they use they don't use it. They did not use a two phase initiative. They used a single phase initiative, group initiative, but with that order of operations: melee, missile, magic, move. So it's really cool that they've kind of codified the move um, plus something at the end. So that's kind of where we stopped. I think they got like about 900 XP, which was kind of good for a first uh, um, opening first level event, uh, I guess, session. So I'd like I'd like to continue at some point. I guess we'll continue if I were short handed on Abomination Vaults and uh, we'll dip into the rogues gallery if people want to play. Um, they could play the comedies. I guess I would give people who played them before divs and then other people can jump in and play someone from the rogues gallery maybe or make their own it's not too hard and the third edition i've noticed they even have like a starter starter pack you know like starter starting equipment which make it easier so there you go that's uh what i did instead of abomination vaults for pathfinder i also played another game of astonishing swordsman and sources of hyperborea this was previous this is on the 15th i believe of yeah it's on the 15th and this is our ongoing almost two-year game campaign i feel it's almost two year um maybe it's longer i'll have to figure it out but anyway i play 
in this game, and I'm an Amazonian warlock named Iphigenia Countadoris. She is a death dealer. Um, I think she's pretty badass. She actually saved the day. Um, Kevin Madison from Dungeon Musings. You can watch this episode from the 15th of January. I'll put a link in the show notes to his YouTube channel. You can search for it. But it was tough. He always throws like uh, the kitchen sink at us um, figuratively. So we had prepared to go into this tower where the, the entrance is underwater. We have allies in these Terra men and these Toad Skipper folk. Um, and they've given us the potions to breathe water, some biological, magical items that can help us out. And uh, we got to the site. It was raining and storming, but it was uneventful. We kind of get into the water and start making our way down. We're tied with some rope to the boat. Um, And we're like assaulted by these crazy two-hit dice lobster things, like giant crayfish things, but with some uh, cunning and capability. And they swarm uh, the hell out of us. And the other two PCs um, who were a monk and another warlock they got beat up pretty bad and i think the only thing that saved my character was dr and i had less things on me and i was at the end and then some toad skippers jumped in i think one died actually but eventually i think i felt like there's no way we can't beat all these things um even though my character was specialized with the spear i mean it I was not killing one per round and they were not killing one per round and that kind of did us in. Uh, they just two swarm tactics are just a deadly thing in these types of games. If you don't have heavy magic to blast things and we don't, right? We did it because we're underwater. We can't cast vocal spells, right? So um, I guess what I do is I swim back to the boat. It takes a couple rounds. I get tagged. I'm, I'm like down to like a handful of hit points, but I get on top of the the boat. We win initiative. Those creatures are snapping at us, but they can't jump through the boat yet. And I just shoot down into the water with a lightning bolt. The cool thing is traditionally um, a lightning bolt becomes a fireball when you shoot it into the water and it annihilated all those little giant crayfish lobster things. And, uh, but now I got to go jump into the water and grab my buddies who are sinking to the bottom. Um, fortunately, they drank potions of water breathing, so they're not dead um, yet. So they stabilized, which was kind of funky. So um, anyway, uh, some really cool sessions of Astonishing Swordsman and Swordsman. Astonishing Swordsman and Sorcerers of Hyperborea, the second edition. That was the second game I talked about. And uh, then this game was the third edition, the game that I ran. Uh, the the trapper's lament so um anyway good stuff i like that game a lot so i would like to continue it and playing it um both playing and running in the future cool all right uh, i think our next caller is going to be joe richter that was a really long response to jason's call but uh hey i got in the recaps i wanted to i got to talk about hyperborea by jeff Telanian. and uh yeah let's go joe so call me Dr. Love. They call me Dr. Love. Calling Dr. Love. I am your doctor of love. Calling Dr. Love. Yo, Carl. Awesome episode, man. Your musical intros between the calls were super dope, dude. Minions was awesome. The one before Jason kicked ass. Uh, and then always, I love your acapella, dude. Uh, <laughs> those who know me well probably wouldn't be at all surprised that I'd be pumped to play Joe Richter, the RPG <laughs> for sure. I thought my Mason story was pretty tame, but I guess in a certain light, it's a little hectic. And then dude, that gumshoe adventure you talked about where you play the sci-fi authors. That sounds super fun. I've heard different things about gumshoe, but you hear different things about all games and you never really know until you play them. So that game sounds super dope. And then the adventure you proposed where my friends disappeared and then showed back up a while later. That was super spooky. Gave me the chills. I loved it. 
Uh, yeah, you sounded really good this episode, man. You sounded pumped and stuff. It was dope. Peace out. Hey, Joe. Thanks for the call. Yeah, I, ha- I have not run Gumshoe. I have a lot of Gumshoe products, like I've mentioned. And there's some really cool adventures. And there's even like a, a Call of Cthulhu apocalypse that, you know, it happens and you're in the middle of it and you got to run to the country. It takes place in England. But um, yeah, it it sounds really cool. I just don't know how to run it. And I feel like I need to run some Gumshoe, um, some either Trail of Cthulhu or Cthulhu Confidential, which is a one-on-one Call of Cthulhu using the Gumshoe rules. Um, Amy's been wanting to try it, so maybe I'll take a crack at that. Um, With your, that that other game, like you and your friend game, um, I think I would probably use a Delta Green be a delta green type of format or scenario because it'd be like modern modern conspiracy horror to me uh, is like delta green right so yeah um hey that would be a fun thing to do i'm really debating i'm playing in a con this weekend bs or con i got three games that i'm playing and i'm not running anything in that con but i'm playing in a savage worlds game it looks like an OSR clone game and then a um, low fantasy gaming game run by Jason Hobbs. I don't know the other two uh, DMs, but I'm sure they'll be great. And um, yeah, it should be a fun con. I am still debating what I want to run for the con that is um, Friends of Jackson Elias is running a con as well in the second weekend of February. And uh, you know, after Valentine's Day, which is a good thing, right? Or is it third weekend then of February? Yeah, I guess it's third weekend of, of February, which is even better. That gives me three weeks to prepare. Maybe I'll do that. But I think I wanted to run my emergency stat scenario for Delta Green. Um, an older Hispanic male dies on the operating table, and there's this weird video that uh, the Delta Green folks want to suppress before it gets out and to track down what happened in that surgery surgery room so that's one scenario the other scenario was something i'm calling the bone collectors and it takes place in the aftermath of the uh what battle is that um man it's not tewksbury it's the other one hold on it is a battle of towton which took place during the War of the Roses. It was fought um, on 29 March 1461 uh, on Palm Sunday during a snowstorm. And I just have some really cool ideas for running. And I want to run like, I want the characters, heroes to be survivable. So I think I want to run, run them as like pulp. So it'd be like medieval pulp Cthulhu. I think it should be pretty crazy. I'll have to do a lot of design on the characters and figure out how do you convert um, the archetype from Pulp Cthulhu into a medieval uh, type of field setting? But uh, knights in armor, man, in heavy armor, uh, or they're yeomen, they're bowmen, or man at arms with big pikes and bill hooks. Yeah, it should be pretty cool. I think I'll probably make three and three, three from Lancaster, three from York. But just in case there are people who join and don't want to play like a military guy, um, then I'll have some some characters made, um, maybe clergy or um, camp followers that are part of, um, most likely part of the Yorkist camp, but I could make one some for either. So yeah, that's what I'm thinking scenario-wise. I think I, I think in my last, or I think I called into your show and also talked about Descendants RPG, and I think because there's like ETU for Savage Worlds, I think I want to do like a Savage Worlds Descendants. So Savage Descendants RPG, I'm sure I'd have to scratch off the serial numbers, but Descendants is a, a show on Disney that's actually pretty good if you like musicals and high school musical and stuff like that. It's not everyone's cup of tea, but uh, Descendants, you the so it's like an exchange program. All the villains are trapped on this island beast and um is like the king 
and his and I guess a beast and Bell are ruling this kingdom, and uh, they have a son, and he is going to be he's a the crown prince, and he wants to have an exchange program whereby the uh, descendants, the sons and daughters of some of the villains who are trapped on that island, come over to the high school um, of Arador or the prep school, whatever. So it's it's cool, it's cute. I can already think. Like on the wiki, like I was looking at the wiki of the different characters, and I could totally develop some archetype from those those wikis. So I think it should be pretty fun, and it's all your fault, Joe. Um, but yeah, so all right, so let's go to the next call. Hey, Carl, Jason here. So I've run Colonial Gothic a couple times. I've got I've got a complete print run. I've got everything that they've produced for it. I don't have the newest iteration done by the Zweihander guys, but I've got everything prior to that. Um, and I've run it a few times, but I, I've never used their system. It seems a bit clunky. I've always used ICRPG, which works really well for it, but... Yep, Colonial Gothic, so it definitely an interesting setting. So, thank you for your show. Wow, Jason, thanks for calling in. I know you were sick, and hey, you still called in. Yeah, it would be really neat. I like ICRPG, and um, it's too bad I missed those Colonial Gothic incarnations that you did. It'd be pretty neat to do. I know, like I said, I'd have a, have a Call of Cthulhu Colonial or something to do with. I think it's a monograph, like I said, of colonial gothic. Not of colonial gothic. Of I'm going to sneeze. But fortunately, I edited out the sneeze. And um, so what I have is a monograph of um, Call of Cthulhu during the revolutionary period. So that'd be kind of neat, too. I also have like a Harlem Unbound Avenger that takes place in the 17th century during the initial colonization of Manhattan by the Dutch. So that would be kind of cool too to do. So yeah, lots of different games to try and to do. Um, so again, thanks for the call when you were sick. That's pretty cool. And maybe you'll get to run Colonial Gothic with one a system of your choice, the one that you are most excited about so you can run the best game ever. And uh, I'll definitely play. All right, in this last segment, I'm going to talk about our most recent session of Twilight 2000, our ongoing Twilight 2000 game using the fourth edition of the rules. And um, it took place last Tuesday, the 18th of January. And we have a good cast of players. Among them is Amy, my wife, who plays the infamous Kasha, who is a Polish partisan. And she has taken some notes, which is neat. Um, it was in the, the day in the campaign, it's the 18th day of the campaign. It is um, 18 days after the Battle of Kalitz, and it's the 4th of August. So, as before, you remember they had survived an ambush. Um, Jonesy had had a run in with some sort of uh, headquarters of some sort of agency who had Russian gear and spoken Russian. They actually shot the guy in the head and escaped uh, the museum where their hideout was located. Kasha had patched him up the night before, and they had joined this convoy um, after an inspection to meet the leader of Krakow, the Dugvada Yosef. So they get to the castle. They see residents on the left. They see a church inside the compound on the right. They see a helicopter in the in the hangar, and it's a um, a hip helicopter.
HIP is the designation that NATO gives it. It is actually an MI-17. So they see that in a hangar. Then they also see that uh, there's a fuel depot surrounded by barbed wire and troops. Uh, there's a sp Above it, there's a tower with a spotlight and machine gun. So they kind of get a good overview of what the, the inside of the castle. Um, near the hangar is a military uh, truck tank as well. And they take the prisoner to meet the leader of Krakow. And he has self styled himself as like a medieval king. He has a ceremonial sword. He makes a big deal um, of holding court. And um, it's unlike the rest of Krakow, which is dingy and dirty. The castle is quite nice and one would say posh, or at least clean. So when he sees, he finally gives audience to the uh, our survivors. He looks at the prisoner. They hand over the prisoner. He actually takes his ceremonial sword and tries to whack the prisoner with it, more or less beats him with it, and cracks you know, the welds on the ceremonial sword. Um, it is a, it becomes a ridiculous scene. But more importantly, the players are, don't, as long as they don't piss him off, they actually impress someone who is his aide. And it looks like the Yosef talks to this major a lot. Um, and, um, right. So, I can't remember. What's the name? Let me get the major's name. The name of the major is a Major Vladislav Kobeki. And he seems to have the ear of the the leader of Krakow. So he, as this this guy, this leader is ranting and raving, and his cronies are trying to calm him down. The major takes the player characters aside and uh, starts to negotiate with them. And then so they move to a, another place to negotiate for real. Like what is the the price for for having that space that you've squatted in? And he really is concerned about this marauder menace, menace and wants the players to deal with it. And that would be part of their payment. Meanwhile, there is this other functionary in there, a lieutenant whose last name is Pos Poskowitz. And he kind of tries to duck out. But uh, Chernov, our Marine recon guy, follows him. And they like literally go to like in the bowels and through the dungeons of this castle like D and D style, and they even have a secret door with a, one of the sconces, and he pulls on it, and the door opens, and he goes through, and Chernoff follows him, and he goes down the spiral staircase uh, that probably leads to the tunnels underneath um, the catacombs, uh, the tunnels from the catacombs that probably lead out of the castle. And the man is talking to someone in Russian. Chernoff can understand Russian, and um, he hears him talking. He says, you need to go up there and find out about this Operation Reset. You need to calm down. Um, oh, Poskowitz ducked out because he recognized Jonesy. Uh, Jonesy had followed him the night before uh, to the museum where he met his potential uh, Soviet uh, contacts. So now Chernov is putting this together with what Jonesy found out. And he strongly suspects they're KGB and Poskowitz is a KGB mole. So... Pasquitz goes, okay, I'm going to go off. And, they, and, they say, and he says he wants to, he actually gives a name and he says he wants to see a man named Malakov. But uh, the person he's talking to says, no, no, it's not time yet. Find out about Operation Reset and we'll get back to you about it. So, so yeah, so Pasquitz goes back, Chernov backs up, tries to hide, decides he wants to confront him and tries to play it off like he's lost. Um, this is when we roll a critical a critical failure. Poskowitz is not convinced, kind of sees through the lie, draws his weapon, and we have this fight in the gallery somewhere in the castle. Um, and um, Chernoff gets a jump on him, slices him across the leg. Uh, Poskowitz takes a shot and misses. I can't believe I missed. Um, that's just what happens. And my guys don't have can't push the role they don't they're not heroes so so there you go I'm, I'm sure like i'd give like a major npc um like a hero point or the equivalent of a being able to push 
but this guy did not have it. And then Chernov stabs him again, and this time in the eye, kills him. So then Boltz runs. Uh, since that shot rings out in the castle, the pa panic ensues, and um, there is this yell. Someone yells, oh, no. Oh, I think one of the player characters actually said, oh, no, they must be trying to assassinate uh, the, the Dakwada, the leader. So they rush him to his safe room. Um, the major's freaking out. He goes, I can't believe this is happening. And he, he kind of, he kind of, um, turn off kind of sidles back in actually. Yeah. Sidles back into the group, but then, uh, Kasha and, uh, uh, grunts are able to go to see the scene of the crime. Since Kasha says, I'm a doctor, I can try to help. They kind of grab some stuff from the fallen Poskowitz and, uh, he's dead. Well, you know, she just says, well, he's dead. <laughs> so, but they play it off really well. Uh, they're able to get out of the castle. Um, they have some really good leads. Um, I think what was very interesting is um, the Major Quebeci said, what is going on? They didn't tell us this was happening. It's happening too fast. He kind of loses his composure and gives a hint that he too might be involved with uh, the KGB or the Russians, so the Soviets in, in the town. So... It seems like the Soviets are trying to play the government of Krakow or people within the government of Krakow, as well as the marauders. And the players are caught in the middle, but now they have a chance with some backing here from Krakow to take care of these marauders, whether or not the Soviets act or not against the players. We'll see. We'll see how, how decisive the players are, how quickly they act. They do know some critical intel about the marauders, like where they're based in the town, the caches that are outside of the city. They've also made contact through Tops and through Chernov with the DIA in town. So, so that's another potential group of people that could help them. So it's actually getting very exciting and things are going to explode in Krakow maybe. We'll see. But a really great set of role-playing, some really good sort of cloak and dagger action the last two times and i'm really enjoying what's going on in krakow so we'll see if the convoy the refugees the survivors can uh, get their hospital get their boarding house save krakow who knows anyway good stuff and we're playing again next week and uh yeah that's uh what's going on in that campaign And I almost forgot something as well that happened in that session. So after they left the castle, they were given a contact. They're given, like, uh, they, they had met this Captain Bosniak, and they had actually saved his, his brother named Stefan. That's the, woman, the man that, he, that Kasha kind of saved from poisoning by some of the mobsters in the town. And uh, they went to, um, yeah, they went back and they passed by St. Mary's Basilica and Amy had a hunch. Amy's character had a hunch, I guess. Maybe Amy had a hunch and she wanted to go there and light some candles um, in the Basilica. They let her go in. It's very odd that the Basilica has some armed guards. Maybe not. It is Krakow after all. So Chernov went with her. And then when they were lighting a candle in the little shrine there, this older man comes to them and says he might, He's heard of them. He's heard of them, and he he really appreciates Americans and what they can do. And uh, maybe he will come to come to them in need of something. He says Poland is at a crossroads, and perhaps it needs some spiritual inspiration. And when they turn around, they see this man, and Kasha recognizes him right away. Chernoff can't quite recall who he is, but it is indeed. Pope John Paul II. He is in Krakow on some sort of mission. He is staying or holed up at the St. Mary's Basilica facility. Um, it's Historically, it's pretty interesting. Pope John Paul II did have an intimate connection to Krakow. He served there uh, twice, uh, once uh, early in his career and later as a cardinal. So it would make sense that he might go there during the wartime and uh, maybe he's got a mission for the players. Their, get, their docket is getting full. 
but uh, some cool stuff. And um, no one, everyone was cool with it. No one felt offended by having the Pope show up. But um, I think it's going to be pretty neat. All right, that's a, that's a, I don't know, from Krakow with Love. All right, folks, I think that'll be it for this session, session, episode of The Geomologist Presents. I definitely want to dedicate a um, single podcast, maybe the next one, to uh, Starfinder. I've played, I've been running my own Starfinder campaign, Horizons, and I've been playing in the Attack of the Swarm campaign run on the Dungeon Musings channel. I play a Solarian, a Vesk Solarian in that one. So I want to maybe dedicate a whole podcast to Starfinder and how cool Starfinder is maybe and give some recaps of the latest games. And I've played another couple games. I played, um, I ran a session of DCC RPG, our Echoes of Palmahalt. BJ Board has given an excellent recap and Jason Connolly gave a recap uh, from Idris's Khan's point of view, his character where Idris saves a day once again. Probably. He has a lot of powerful spells now, and Jason rolls really well. Don't believe him. He's lucky. Lucky as hell. Or rolls roll on the d20. He's got the algorithm down. So um, I'll talk about that, I think, in another uh, episode. And then definitely talk about Jackals, which I ran this past Sunday um, for uh, a couple people. And I'm looking for players for Jackals. So if you listen here and you want to get up early on a Sunday morning every other week, uh, Jackal's a really cool game. It's a Near East-inspired Bronze Age setting game. Um, takes place on a different world than Earth, but there are some definitely definite orthologs of some Bronze Age civilizations that are in that game. So anyway, thanks again for the call-ins from Joe and Jason, and thank you again for listening to the Geomologist Presents. Uh, the music comes from a couple places. The intro and outro is done by TJ Drennan, and the interim music is from the website that I use that is called, the website is called Looperman, and on there you can find, as with, the, with the registration, you can find free music loops, acapellas, and vocals. So it's a cool site, and um, I suggest it for the intro, not, well, inter, inter, intersection music. It's nice to break things up sometimes, right? Okay, well, uh, with that, we'll just uh, get out of here. TJ, take us out.